These are the top 10 NHL facts you don't know. One game to none. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Underway in game two. Panthers dump it in. Starting at number 10, the first hockey pucks were apparently made out of frozen cow dung. Surprising, right? Now this is the reason why. In order to avoid bouncing, modern hockey pucks are frozen before usage. They measure three inches in diameter and one inch thick. Even while it appears straightforward, it wasn't always so tidy, evidently. Legend has it that the original hockey pucks were made from frozen cow stool. According to NHL.com, before evolving into the rubber slab we use today, the cow dung pucks were made of wood, stones, old parts of bonded tires, and broken lacrosse balls. As fans, we've all wondered how painful it would be to be smacked in the face by a hockey puck. Now picture a hockey puck made entirely of feces. <laughs> At number nine, we have the Toronto Maple Leafs and Edmonton Oilers almost traded arenas in 1980. In the NHL, many strange deals have occurred, but if it had actually happened, this one would have been the most unusual. League-changing moves are nothing new to former Edmonton Oilers owner Peter Pocklington. Wayne Gretzky was notoriously sold to the Los Angeles Kings by Pocklington in 1988. Pocklington penned a book titled I'd Trade Him Again to defend his decision. Pocklington discusses another trade in the book that would have undoubtedly raised some questions. Harold Ballard, the previous owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs, allegedly contacted Pocklington about moving the team to a different arena. Due to his financial difficulties, Ballard basically gave away the iconic Maple Leaf Gardens in exchange for the Edmonton Oilers home arena and $50 million in cash. There would be games in Toronto for the Oilers and Edmonton for the Leafs. Pocklington thought he would earn a fortune in Toronto and was thrilled about the prospect of changing markets. Then, for reasons Pocklington did not know, Ballard pulled out of the agreement. At number eight, Roger Nielsen being responsible for not one, not two, but three. Hilarious rule changes. More antics than any other coach occurred throughout the 25 years that Roger Nielsen was behind NHL benches, serving in a variety of coaching roles. Nielsen was an avid reader of the NHL rulebook and was constantly searching for methods to take advantage of the stated regulations. Nielsen's persistent ability to uncover loopholes compelled the league to amend the rules several times. Here are some of it. Putting a defenseman in net for penalty shots rather than a goaltender. Though goalies are typically thought of as the experts at stopping the puck, Nielsen valued a defenseman's adaptability when playing one-on-one. -on -one. Nielsen decided to send in a blue liner after noticing that the rule book does not indicate which kind of player is picked to defend a penalty shot. The league needed to take this seriously. Pulling the goalie, but having the goaltender leave his stick behind to guard the net Nielsen would typically yank his goalie in the closing minutes of a game when his side was down. In an unconventional move though, he would have the goalie abandon his stick to obstruct sliding pucks that were moving toward the open cage. The league swiftly addressed this, and goalies are no longer permitted to purposefully leave equipment behind, taking concurrent too many men penalties to waste time. Nielsen also employed a cunning tactic of constantly putting too many players onto the ice at the conclusion of the third period to squander time. It was practically hard for the opposition to build up anything in the hopes of tying the game face-off after face-off, with another man under Nielsen's coaching headed to the box. Whether you consider Nielsen's antics to be cheap or not, you have to admire the inventiveness of a coach who is maybe the most cunning to ever work in the NHL. At number seven, the Penguins had a live mascot named Penguin Pete. Unfortunately, this is a very sad story. The Penguins owner, Jack McGregor, came up with the concept of using a live mascot during games back in the late 1960s. Pete was borrowed by McGregor from the Pittsburgh Zoo, and his goal was to see whether the Ecuadorian penguin could genuinely pick up skating. They had bespoke skates made by CCM to fit the peculiar foot and leg anatomy of penguins. In the end, things didn't work out, and Pete contracted pneumonia. After being brought back to the Pittsburgh Zoo, he passed quite quickly. Coming down at number six, octopus throwing is a lucky tradition for Red Wings fans. 
In 1952, when there were just six NHL clubs, the Stanley Cup was won with eight playoff victories. And congratulates the Detroit Red Wings on their record-breaking undefeated drive to the Stanley Cup. Consider eight victories as an octopus's tentacles. When Pete and Jerry Cusimano hurled an octopus onto the ice during a Red Wings playoff game that year, they were thinking along those same lines. Since winning the cup, octopi have come to represent the team's good fortune. Additionally, an octopus was adopted as the team's official mascot in 1995. At number five, ice in the rink is less than an inch thick. I guess some people don't know this until now. Comment if you knew about this. A professional hockey rink maintains a temperature of minus nine degrees Celsius, 16 degrees Fahrenheit, with an ice covering that is just three quarters inch, 1.90 centimeters thick. Water may freeze more quickly and forcefully through thinner ice layers. The ice gets softer and moves more slowly the thicker it gets. At number four, the Anaheim Ducks got their name from a Disney movie. Fascinating, right? Do you recall the Mighty Ducks? The firm used to own the hockey team in Anaheim, California, which was named after the well-known Disney movie. Various parts of the US, and then the other half, yeah. that's right, the Ducks. A year after Disney sold the team in 2007, the Anaheim Mighty Ducks took home the Stanley Cup. They are currently referred to as the Anaheim Ducks. At number three, referees dropped the puck for a good reason. In a face-off, the puck was placed between the sticks of the two players by the hockey referees using their hands before 1914. It was evident that this was a bad idea. Rather than putting it between the pucks, they started dropping it after several wounds, bruises, and maybe broken bones. At number two, we have the Lucky Charms on Ice, Brian Boyle's pregame ritual. Brian Boyle, an NHL center with experience, is renowned for his thorough morning rituals. But what really makes him stand out is the peculiar beforehand snack he chose, Lucky Charms cereal. Before hitting the ice, Boyle, who has played for a number of clubs, has been seen gorging on a bowl of the sweet treat. Maybe there's a mystical quality to those marshmallows that powers his performance while he skates. Finally, at number one, hockey is believed to be invented by British soldiers and was originally played as ball. It is said that hockey first appeared in the 18th century. British soldiers stationed in Canada are supposed to have originated it. In their spare time, these troops would travel to the frozen lakes to play this game. Naturally, no one can truly verify this tale because the history of the game is not documented in writing. On the other hand, most people agree that hockey started in Canada. Given that we are discussing the snow country here, it should come as no surprise. The puck was not used in the game's original invention. Rather, a ball was used for play. This is because the game was first played on grass rather than on ice. The puck wasn't introduced until much later when the game was played on ice. This is because a puck glides on ice more easily than a ball does. This is really fascinating. Hockey is not just a sport, but also has a very interesting historical background that most people don't know about. Do you think there are some facts we left out? We would like to hear them in the comments section.